Good morning. So I'm Charu Bavari. I'm one of the vascular surgeons at uh, Methodist Hospital, also a family feud host and other side jobs in case this vascular thing doesn't work out. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, DVT and PE. Uh, it's a wonderful talk to a wonderful talk that you gave, Huey. It's hard to beat such a succinct, succinct and uh, detailed talk. But I'm, this is easy. You either anticoagulate or you do something else. It's very easy. Also, oh, VTE or venous thromboembolism is DVT and PE. It's pretty bad because it happens often, it happens bad, and we miss it sometimes, and people die from that. That's the that's the bottom line for actually intervening uh, sooner and identifying sooner. Long-term complications of DVT are you know DVT itself can cause post-thrombotic syndrome in the leg, and then PE is of of course the most uh, preventable cause of in-hospital deaths now. And so a PE in the hospital is a major red flag for quality for the hospital, quality for the surgeon, and the, and the, um, and the people taking care of this patient. 10% uh, will die within three months. That's a staggering number, right? One in three will be dead in three months if not treated or caught in time or have complications from that. And 70 to 80% of fatal PEs happen more so in non-surgical patients. So it's not just surgeons, uh, but in general, any medical patient can have that. Uh, there's a lot of risk factors for VTE, of course. Uh, biggest risk factors are the fracture of a long bone, like uh, the, fem the femur, uh, or a fracture of the hip joint. If they have hip or knee replacement, uh, major general surgery, major trauma, a spinal cord injury, which leaves them supine for a while. And those are the really big, strong risk factors. Ma the thing to remember is majority of all patients with P VTE will at least have one risk factor going into it. And typically we say, you know, it takes two hands to clap, so you have a combination of two, actually. So uh, not just one. Not, you, you, cannot, you cannot say that, okay, you're on contraceptive pills, you're going to get a DVT. No, that's not right. You should have something more going on with that. Uh, clinical presentation, DVT in upper and lower extremities, swelling, swelling, and swelling. Remember, D, it does not come with a cold hand or a cold leg. It comes with swelling. That's the first thing that happens. And it's usually sudden overnight. Somebody goes to bed, gets up, or somebody is... Uh, Sitting down gets up and they start feeling swelling in the leg. Uh, it's, there is pain on passive movement and on active movement of the extremity. There are dilated veins that can show up, but they show up usually later. Uh, there's color changes in the leg extremity. And DVTs can also happen asymptomatic. So they have some nagging pain in the, in the leg and then they come up and saying, I've got this mild swelling and they actually have DVT sometimes. Most often they're all tibial DVTs and not very proximal DVTs. Uh, trauma, infection, PAD, they can, uh, you can get concurrent DVTs at the same time. They're easy to miss and with high, have a high index of suspicion. So anyone with leg swelling or arm swelling, which happens overnight, have a very low threshold for getting an ultrasound. Okay, so PE presents uh, sometimes very suddenly and sometimes not so suddenly, but dyspnea or pleuritic chest pain or cough, the top three symptoms that come in. Substernal chest pain can be confused with a lot of other etiologies, right? Uh, the initial evaluation, usually everyone gets a chest x-ray, an EKG, a pulse ox. ABG, not so common, but a CT scan for sure. I mean, you walk in with a headache, you get a CAT scan. So at least an hour year. And then the VQ scan, I've, I've yet to see a VQ scan in the last, I think, six months. It's not done very commonly, at least not that we do very commonly anymore. And pulmonary angiograms are almost obsolete now for diagnosis. We do it for treatment, but not for di primary diagnosis, because the CT angio gives you a lot more information. Uh, Pathophysiology, I mean, you all are more experts on this than I am, but essentially this is bad. And so life-threatening PE happens when there is a combination of a large embolus and there's underlying cardiopulmonary disease or um, dysfunction, and that leads to hemodynamic instability. Essentially, it's the RV that gets affected first, and there's a, there's a pretty bad cycle that goes on into coronary um, hypoxia, and then finally death eventually. Uh, there is a massive, there is a submassive, and there is a minor PE. So the massive PE and the minor PE are the small components. The submassive is what you all will see, or we see a lot, which is um, there is subnormal RV function, or there is evidence of some myocardial necrosis, but the patient's not incredibly hemodynamically unstable. And the massive one is where there is sustained hemodynamic instability in spite of resuscitation. A good finding is on the CAT scan, or just like a uh, eyeball thing, is if the RV is more is the RV to LV ratio is 0 0.9 or more. Typically, it should be less than that. And then 0 0.9 or more says that the RV is dilated and uh, has <clears throat> as an evidence of strain. And that also tells you there's increased PA pressures. There's, there's 
the echo will tell you there's hypokinesis, and you all do that much better than I do. But that's how we at least interpret, interpret this. The severity of PE, so uh, anyone above 80 years, history of cancer, history of chronic cardiopulmonary disease, uh, tachycardia, hypotension, and hypoxia, really bad combos together. That mortality goes super high, super high. Uh, goals of treatment are to prevent the mortality, prevent the late onset of thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and uh, Huey and Tom are the experts that we are lucky to have at Methodist who can help us with those patients. And then overall improve quality of life. Uh, you know what? This is actually, I had another presentation on this. Someone uploaded the wrong one. But we are missing the DVT part on this one. Uh, the treatment for PE, if you have a high, low or a high probability of PE and you don't have the luxury of getting a CAT scan, sometimes just an echo will t tell you whether you, are, you have RV dysfunction. And then if you really strongly suspect PE and there's no contraindication to anticoagulation, it is probably safer to empirically start them on anticoagulation. That's the number one thing that's going to help them. Worldwide, that's the standard of care, anticoagulation first. And then you go into adjunct maneuvers um, after that. The ACCP guidelines say that um, thrombolytics should be considered in people who are hemodynamically inst unstable. Catheter-directed thrombolysis when there is a high, actually it says high risk of bleeding, but if there is a moderate risk of bleeding, so you don't want to give a big slug of IV thrombolytics, thrombolytics you can give catheter-directed thrombolytics. For submassive PEs, usually anticoagulation is the first mainstay. You have to start with that. And then consider thrombolytics or catheter-directed thrombolysis in some in select patients. Uh, so why should we treat them? I mean, we ask ourselves question, a question. We are so scared of... Uh, treating patients with PE because we know they can go south pretty fast. But if we don't do it, they go south faster, I think. So you have persistent RV dysfunction when the patient goes home, and they are eight times more likely to have a recurrent PE. When they have a recurrent PE, the mortality goes you know, sky high. And at one year, they will have chronic pulmonary hypertension. And that just starts the spiral of you know, just not a, a bad quality of life, uh, consistent uh, pulmonary hypertension, and so on. Uh, the RV hypokinesis on baseline echo was associated with about 50, 57, more than half higher mortality rate at three months. So that's why we want to go after that PE to, to decrease the pressure on the RV. Uh, systemic thrombolysis, uh, it decreases mortality. It lowers the incidence of PE, but it does increase bleeding complications. So the complications go from then. There's a buffet of rates which have been um, uh, measured and reported from as less than 1% to about 20%. And the intracranial hemorrhage, that's the one that really kills uh, not just the patient, but the quality of life for everyone in the family. And that's about 0 to 3%. Uh, the thing is about even when patients are screened for absolute contraindications and so on, and we think they are safe, there is still a rate of, there is still a, a, a significant risk for bleeding. And so that's why we are a little scared of doing thrombolysis. But you know, in most patients, if we, um, if you're careful enough and monitor them enough, it should be okay. Absolute contraindication, just remember this, if nothing else from this talk, is any prior intracerebral hemorrhage, if you have a known AVM, if you have, have, if you have a known intracranial neoplasm, if there is a prior ischemic stroke within the last three months, usually six weeks is what they say, but three months, you can stretch it maybe, and then active internal bleeding, uh, that is you know, a GI, a peptic ulcer that's bleeding, or you have a, a tumor in the colon that's bleeding, or you have, um, any kind of bleeding, that's bad. And then if you have suspected aortic dissection or if you have active pericarditis, that's also a contraindication. The areas of uncertainty are we don't have a lot of control trials for systemic versus catheter directed for massive versus submassive. So what we know is, you know, thrombolytics work, catheter directed thrombolytics also work, but whether one is more superior, we don't know. Uh, there is the low-dose systemic lysis versus catheter-directed thrombolysis. There could be a risk stratification for submassive PE who would actually benefit from catheter-directed thrombolysis. But it's usually the first line to offer a patient, that at least we do, catheter-directed thrombolysis, is usually the first line to offer so that you give them smaller doses and the bleeding complication rates are slightly smaller. Uh, thrombus fragmentation is we go in with catheters and then you rotate a pigtail catheter, you just swirl it around. It's not all that effective, but if it is fresh enough, you might actually get some clot out. Uh, it's cheap. Hospital administrators will love you for that. And there is a, but there is a high risk of embolization into the distal small pulmonary vasculature. 
it does require adjunctive modality, so this thing won't suck clot out because the holes are so small. Even the end of the catheter is very tiny. So you might need some aspiration thrombectomy on this one. So this is a catheter aspiration with an, it's called the Inari uh, thrombectomy device, where there are three rings, you go along the clot, go across it, and then pull that clot into the, into the aspiration catheter. Uh, this is a rheolysis, which is um, the angiojet thrombolysis. It injects TPA and then sucks it through another channel. This is actually contraindicated in PE. Remember that. If someone says, I want to use angiojet in PE, you should say, find a new hospital. Because this is actually not indicated for PE. Because the risk of embolization, risk for pulmonary hemorrhage is high. Uh, thrombolytic infusion catheter, these are our go-to workhorses for PE thrombolysis, where we have a McNamara catheter, which is a multi-hole catheter, multi-side hole. And there is an ECOS, which is uh, there is an ultrasound a wire that goes through the catheter, it pulses the thrombolytics through the clot. They, there was a Seattle 2 trial which uh, said that there was, they used two arms, low dose thrombolytics and, and standard dose thrombolytics. Both have shown benefit in long term, where they have, both have reduced the RV LV diameter ratio, both have de decreased the RV dysfunction on post, post procedure echo. So that was significantly. Uh, a, I mean, a great uh, pat on the back for people who are doing catheter-based thrombolysis. There was a randomized control trial of uh, ECOS versus uh, just catheter-directed thrombolysis. So there the, sorry, ECOS versus anticoagulation for the submassive PE. The results was the th catheter-directed thrombolysis was superior. The reduction was at 24 hours, and then there was no significant bleeding risk. They had two deaths, though, of bleeding complications not related to this, uh, but other events um, in the hospital. They don't tell us that. And then there was another comparative outcome of uh, ECOS versus the McNamara catheter. And then there was no difference in outcome, no difference in complications. So essentially, they ju you just need a catheter to give thrombolytics inside the clot. It doesn't matter if you have ultrasound pulsating. It doesn't matter if you have your music playing in the background. You just have to have some thrombolytic going in there. Uh, treatment of DVT with pregnancy, this is a big question that always comes up. Uh, it's very. Um, it's, it's not controversial, it's just that it, it, we don't have clear-cut guidelines uh, or strong guidelines. But the general guidelines are you stop 24 hours prior to inducing labor or a C-section. Preferably a C-section is what they say. And then extend, uh, oh, by the way, give low molecular weight heparin or Lovenox or those agents. So extend the treatment six weeks after delivery and then consider uh, prophylaxis six weeks post-delivery for moderate to high-risk uh, patients. Uh, a filter, everyone loves to place a filter. And we hate to take them out because we've seen so many bad complications. So um, my advice to you all is there are very few indications now to place an IVC filter. So remember them, you'll sleep happy, your patients will be happier. So a recent proximal DVT or PE and plus an absolute contraindication to full anticoagulation. That is, if you have an active brain bleed, you have active GI bleeding, you've had a massive bleed somewhere with anticoagulation before, or you have skin necrosis with warfarin in the past, these people are the not, well, you have newer anticoagulants, but you have had a complication from bleeding, you should get an IVC filter. And that filter then becomes your permanent filter. A second, uh, uh, a second clot on anticoagulation becomes an absolute indication. You have to put a filter in. Uh, remember this, that uh, all, of all the filters placed, more than half have never been removed. And that's the problem, is things are left behind. And they get cro crooked, they get torn, they get bad stuff. So uh, one case, a 58-year-old lady who comes in um, with shortness of breath after a flight. Uh, she has factor V Leiden deficiency. She's had all these surgeries done. And uh, she denies tobacco. Her exam, she's a little tachycardic, a little hypotensive, a little hypoxic. So she's a little bit of everything. Uh, her lungs are clear, she's tachycardic, but uh, there are no murmurs. I do listen to murmurs, by the way. Very, very few people. Um, and then her troponin has a little leak there. So her CT shows she does have submassive PE where she's got this you know, pretty large burden on the left. You don't see, this is one shot, so you don't see much on the right there. So the imaging says she has a depressed RV function, and then the RV to LV ratio is 1.4. She was not contraindicated for lysis. This is what happened at the hospital. They decided to call the clot busters. So they called this team. So we have, we have to have a dedicated PERT team. Is every hospital should have one. One who recognizes, one who diagnoses, one who treats. Unfortunately, they didn't call any of these guys. They called us, unfortunately. So we stepped in. We did a pulmonary angiogram, and we found a significant clot on the right side. This projection doesn't show well on the left, but then she also has a clot on the left side. 
We went in, we placed the ECOS uh, thrombolytic catheters on both sides. Her tachycardia hypoxia improved. Her, uh, on a venous duplex, she had a right peroneal popliteal DVT. Remember, you may not find a big DVT in the femoral vein because that clot's already gone. And so you may not even, you don't even have to look for that. Um, and she had an improvement on echo. And, oh. So she did well. And so did we. So PE essentially is lethal, and, but it's preventable. Uh, RV dysfunction is the main cause of death. You all know that already. And uh, anticoagulation, it halts propagation but it does not clear the thrombus. So sometimes thrombus load clearance is critical. Uh, systemic thrombolysis can restore RV function, but there is a risk of bleeding. And then uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis actually is safe and effective for submassive PEs. It improves the RV function, and it reduces total dose requirement for the patient. Uh, you need to have a dedicated PER team, which we are trying to build, and I'm sure we will have something in place very soon. And thank you so much for your attention.